Starship gets its final touches, NASA's science programs may be in danger, and we just saw SpaceX's most international crew ever. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 1st of September, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. NASA is getting ready to recover the samples from the OSIRIS-REx mission to asteroid Bennu. This week, teams conducted a dress rehearsal of the operation in the Utah desert in preparation for the return capsule to arrive on September 24th. On August 29th, they tested the approach and recovery of the capsule with a mock-up. This is important ahead of handling the post-recovery operations of the capsule and its samples on board. This rehearsal included checking for hazards such as corrosive materials, unexploded ordnance, and other potentially hazardous substances. This was then followed with packaging and transport rehearsals to prepare for the real deal. On the following day, August 30th, the teams tested the parachute system by dropping the mock-up from a helicopter at an altitude of 2 kilometers. This will be the final phase of the return of the capsule, and this test helped the teams exercise the tracking and search capabilities that they have. During a press conference shortly after these tests, NASA officials confirmed that they were ready for the return and overviewed the preparation process prior to landing. Looking ahead, there will be a go-no-go no go poll about five to six hours prior to landing. If all's ready to go, the return capsule will separate from the main spacecraft about four hours prior to landing. If conditions are not suitable for this, the spacecraft is capable of aborting the release of the capsule and maneuvering into a trajectory that will bring it back to Earth two years from now. So you can really see these folks don't leave anything to chance. Once the capsule is separated, the main spacecraft will perform an evasive burn 20 minutes later and will then fly by the Earth at an altitude of 800 kilometers. It'll then prepare for its extended mission, which will include a flyby of asteroid Apophis in 2029. The re-entry capsule will start its entry through the atmosphere about 13 minutes prior to landing at an altitude of 130 kilometers and at a speed of about 12 kilometers per second. Within just three minutes, that speed will have gone down to just under 300 meters per second, which is less than the speed of sound. Hopefully, if all goes well, in less than four weeks, scientists will get their hands on fresh samples of an asteroid that may help us to better understand the origins of the solar system. While that bit of NASA science will hopefully be arriving soon, there are some others that will have to wait just a bit longer. NASA announced this week that it is delaying its next New Frontiers competition. New Frontiers missions are NASA science missions generally focused on furthering our understanding of the solar system. This is in contrast to flagship class missions, which are one-of-a-kind missions with large budgets, or lower-cost, more goal-oriented discovery class missions. The first of this class of missions was New Horizons, which was followed by Juno and later by OSIRIS-REx, which was mentioned in the last segment. The next New Frontiers mission, selected back in 2019, is set to launch a robotic helicopter to Saturn's moon Titan. However, in recent years, the science division at NASA has been suffering budget issues, which includes the delay of that Titan mission's launch from 2026 to now no earlier than 2027. These budget cuts have also delayed the start of the competition for the next New Frontiers mission, which was set to start this fall and now won't be until 2026. That's a three-year delay for those counting at home. Now, as you can imagine, this is not an easy decision to make, and it adds to NASA's long list of recent science budget troubles. Most recently, the New Horizons mission and teams were also restructured to only focus on heliophysics research and also had to stop all of their research on the Kuiper Belt. One thing that I am sure of is that I would not want to be the one having to make these decisions. It's really sad to see that some missions might not get funded in time, and other science opportunities just getting delayed by years. It's really getting tough, you guys. Now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. A Series 1 rocket lifted off on August 25th at 4.59 UTC from Site 95A at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket carried the Zhilin-1 Wideband O2A satellite to sun-synchronous orbit. The Wideband O2A satellite is the first of the new generation of Zhilin-1 commercial satellites from Chongguang Satellite Technology. This new type of satellite is capable of delivering 150 kilometer wide images at 50 centimeters per pixel resolution. This Falcon 9 lifted off on August 27th at 105 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It carried the latest batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage, B-1080, was flying for a third time and successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. 
This mission marked the 5,000th Starlink satellite that SpaceX has launched so far. A Chongzheng 2D rocket took off on August 31st at 7.36 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. The mission was carrying three Yaogan-39 satellites into low Earth orbit. These satellites are the first set of the Yaogan-39 class of military reconnaissance satellites. These are aimed at electronic signals intelligence gathering from orbit. Another Falcon 9 lifted off on September 1st at 2.21 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission was carrying another batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites to low Earth orbit. The first stage, B-1077, was flying for a seventh time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. With this mission, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,027 Starlink satellites, of which 4,683 remain in orbit and 3,936 are in operational orbit. This week, we also had the launch of SpaceX's seventh crew rotation mission to the International Space Station. Liftoff of Falcon 9 with Crew Dragon Endurance took place on August 26th at 7.27 UTC from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. The booster, B-1081, was a new booster, and it returned back to land at SpaceX's Landing Zone 1 at Cape Canaveral. The crew of Endurance consisted of Commander Jasmine Mogbelli from NASA, Pilot Andreas Mogensen from ESA, Mission Specialist Satoshi Furukawa from JAXA, and Mission Specialist Konstantin Borisov from Roscosmos. This is the first time that all four crew members of Dragon were from four different agencies and countries, which is really cool! The mission also marked the first time a European astronaut held the position of pilot of a US spacecraft, and also the third time that a female astronaut commanded a Crew Dragon capsule. Endurance successfully docked with the Zenith port of the ISS Harmony module on August 27th at 13.16 UTC. This will mark the start of the handover period between Crew 7 and Crew 6. This handover period should last until September 2nd, when Crew 6 is currently scheduled to undock from the ISS. Crew 6's splashdown the day after will mark the fulfillment of SpaceX's original commercial crew contract, with all of the initial six operational missions completed from launch to splashdown. But don't worry, there are still many more Crew Dragon missions left to complete. Crew 7 is just the first of up to eight more missions that SpaceX has been awarded for the commercial crew contract, and there are a few other private missions as well, so they've definitely got their work cut out for them. SpaceX is in the final stretch to ready its Starship rocket for the next launch. Last week, Super Heavy Booster 9 completed a static fire test of all 33 Raptor engines. Although two of them shut down early, the remaining 31 fired for full duration, clearing the test duration requirements. But you probably already know this if you watched our latest Starbase update video. Right on the heels of this test, Ship 25 is being prepared at Starbase's Rocket Garden with the vehicle receiving its new and shiny livery ahead of launch. This includes the addition of SpaceX's X logo on the center of the nose cone and S25 logos on each side of it. Workers have also been seen putting the final touches on the vehicle's thermal protection system tiles. This is on top of other more subtle work performed on the vehicle, such as the installation of a new vent pipe on the engine section and reinforcement welds on that same section. The latest local notice to Mariners by the U.S. Coast Guard still shows a potential launch attempt no earlier than September 8th, but as we said a few weeks ago, don't book those tickets just yet as paperwork still needs to be approved for this flight. It does show that SpaceX is definitely approaching that second launch of Starship though, and we may very well see Ship 25 stacked on Booster 9 sooner rather than later. Firefly Aerospace says it is now ready to demonstrate rapid launch capabilities for the U.S. Space Force. The company's next mission, Victus Knox, is set to be the third flight of its Alpha rocket and will attempt to demonstrate rapid response capabilities by launching 24 hours after satellite delivery. Millennium Space Systems, the manufacturer of the payloads for this rapid launch demonstrator, also has the task of fueling and integrating the spacecraft on the rocket's payload adapter in less than 60 hours. Both Millennium and Firefly are currently in what is called a hot standby phase, where each is awaiting the call from the U.S. Space Force to launch the mission. This is part of the Space Force's effort to develop the capability to rapidly respond to on-orbit needs from a national security standpoint. Over the last few months, Firefly and Millennium have been rehearsing these operations and training the teams on getting both the satellite and the rocket ready in the time required. 
This included an all-up test that went from simulated attachment of the satellite to the rocket's payload adapter, all the way to the firing of the engines on the launch pad without releasing it. This is a really hard task, and many other companies have tried it before without success. So hopefully this time around, it works for good. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. With Chandrayaan-3's lunar module successfully on the moon, its science activities have now begun. One of the first science results coming out of it was done with the CHAST instrument. This stands for Chandra's Surface Thermophysical Experiment. This is in essence a small drill that pokes into the ground and takes temperature measurements at different depths. CHAST has found that the temperature under the surface can drop from about 50 down to negative 10 degrees Celsius within the span of just 8 centimeters. This just shows the incredible insulation properties of the lunar regolith that could mean that we may not have to dig very deep to find ice on the south polar regions of the moon. While this is just one of the many science experiments being performed by the lunar module, the Pragyan rover has been driving around demonstrating autonomous navigation as well as surveys of the lander post-landing. It's really awesome to see so many great results from this mission, and you can bet we'll be covering it a lot more once it wraps up in just a few days from now. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, has found what is likely to be the crash site of the Russian Luna 25 lander. If you remember from last week, the lander fired its main engine for longer than expected while maneuvering to a lower orbit, which led to its crash on the lunar surface. Predictions shortly after showed the spacecraft should have crashed on the inner rim of the Ponte Coulomb G crater. And this is precisely where NASA's LRO has found a new crater, so it definitely looks like they found the final resting place of Luna 25. ESA has delayed the latest hot fire test of the agency's Ariane 6 rocket. This test, which was planned to occur on August 29th, has had to be postponed to September 5th due to a, quote, technical issue affecting the control bench governing the critical fluidic operations. With this delay, we'll have to wait and see whether the agency is still on track to perform the second, much longer hot firing test of Ariane 6 in late September as scheduled. ULA CEO Tori Bruno has announced this week that the Centaur 5 upper stage for Vulcan's first flight is now undergoing proof testing after finishing fabrication. This upper stage had to be completely remanufactured from the start, with added reinforcements in light of the investigation into a test stand anomaly that occurred back in March. You probably know the whole story if you watched the previous episodes of This Week in Space Flight. At the same time, NASA has said this first flight of Vulcan is now planned to occur no earlier than the middle of December. That looks really close to the end of the year, so don't be surprised if this eventually slips into 2024. And now, let's go over next week in spaceflight. A PSLV XL is set to lift off on September 2nd at 620 UTC from the Satish Devon Space Center. It'll be carrying the Aditya L1 Solar Observatory to the Sun-Earth Lagrange Point 1. Next week will be the return of the Crew-6 mission back to Earth. Crew Dragon Endeavor is currently planned to undock from the ISS on September 2nd at 1405 UTC. Splashdown off the coast of Florida is scheduled to occur on September 3rd at 458 UTC, but as you probably know by now, weather hasn't been great near Florida lately, so those dates are all subject to change. A Falcon 9 rocket is set to lift off next week, carrying another batch of Starlink V2 mini-satellites. Launch is currently scheduled to occur within a 4-hour, 30-minute window that opens on September 3rd at 23.07 UTC. This will be the first Starlink launch from Launch Complex 39A since February of this year, and will leave Space Launch Complex 40 free for teams to work on the start of its crew access tower. Virgin Galactic has announced its next commercial launch, Galactic 03, is set to occur no earlier than September 8th. While a takeoff time hasn't been published yet, it is expected to follow similar past timelines and occur in the morning hours of the day, local time. The pilots and passengers for this flight haven't been announced as of this recording. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.